Please be seated. We're going to dive right back up into worship after we look at the Word of God and after we break the bread together and share communion uh, with one another in the presence of Jesus. Uh, but, but we are going to uh, open God's Word. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, to open to Luke chapter 11. And as you're, as you're turning to Luke chapter 11, if, you're going, if you have an app, if you go to Luke chapter 11 and open that and have it in front of you, um, if you use your phone or if you use your, your, uh, your tablet or something like that, that's great, but just make sure you're not streaming, other, you know, you're not getting distracted by things. Really stay focused because God has something to say to you tonight. Tonight we're talking about the parable, a, sh- a short parable, but then after the parable, Jesus does some teaching and some illustrating to bring that parable alive. And if you really pay attention, if you really open your heart, God's going to speak to you about prayer in a fresh new way. But we're going to be talking tonight about the God who is listening. What's your fundamental core belief about God when it comes to prayer? And if you're a Christian, you say, oh, I believe in prayer. That's great. I want to go deeper than that. You say, oh, I believe in God. That's great. I want to go deeper than that. So, so when you think about how God Almighty engages with you, looks upon you, interacts with you, would you say, you know, honestly, I don't pray a ton because I'm not sure God really cares. I've talked to Christians who said, I don't know if, I just don't, I mean, I love Jesus, I believe he died on the cross and rose again, but does he really care about what's happening in my normal days? Does he care about my little stuff? Is it a big deal to God? I've heard people say, I don't know if God really notices me. I don't know if, if you know, I, I'm just an, or, I mean, the people around me don't notice me. Why would God notice me? And there's a sense that, why would I bring my prayers to God and talk to God if I, I don't know that he's paying attention to me? Sometimes I think we feel like God's too busy. Yeah, I, I know God's there, I know God's powerful, but you know, God's worried about Ukraine. You know, God's worried about big stuff. My stuff just doesn't rise up to the level of getting the attention of God. There's lots of ways we can look at God and look at prayer. All the ones I just talked about are not biblical at all. When we dig into Luke chapter 11, you're gonna have a new vision of prayer, a new sense of how God listens, how God cares, and I hope a new movement of prayer in your life because you understand that God is actually listening. God is, God is waiting to talk with you. He, he's always talking to you through his word, by his spirit, but he's waiting for you to talk to him. You know, and I, and I, was, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about, you know, we have uh, you know, Elizabeth who's here and she leads worship in a, in a church over in Santa Cruz and she's now married and has a couple of kids. And, and so, you know, is, is the God of heaven waiting for Elizabeth to bring a concern about she now has a little boy and a little girl. Does God care about her heart and her concerns for her little ones in this crazy world? The answer is yes. God cares deeply and desperately about that. I got chatting with Brandon who plays keys for us and, and Brandon is a, uh, is a photographer. And Brandon is a, this, this time of year, uh, kind of summer, fall is busy time. The fact that Brandon is here, was here tonight early to practice and helping lead us in worship by playing keys. He's not on staff. He's not paid. He just shows up to serve Jesus and to help us come into the presence of Jesus. But we got chatting before the service, and, we, and, and I've known Brandon for years, and I just asked him, I know, I'm going to know about some things happening, so I've asked him, but we just had a quick little chat about it. And I was thinking, you know, does God care about some of the, the business challenges that a member of our congregation has? And the answer is Yes. God cares. And so my prayer is that as we look at this, as we look at this parable, as we dig into this, that, that you'll, you'll start to say, wait, you mean, you mean God cares about me like that? You mean God is listening to me like that? As a matter of fact, one of the things that's beautiful in this parable is it paints a picture, and the whole point of the picture isn't that God's just like that. The, pay, the point of the picture in this parable is God's way better than that. Some parables are kind of like, well, God's like this. Some are like, hey, God's way better than that. God's not like that. He's actually much better. Look for that as we open the scriptures. In Luke chapter 11, you'll often hear me say as a pastor, and it's just kind of a little, a little memorable way of understanding that we've got to think about what's happening in the biblical text. Every text have a, has a context. Every passage in the Bible, every text in the Bible has a context. So if you, if you were walking into, up to a couple people talking, and you walked up to them in the middle of a conversation, and they've been talking for 15 minutes, and you jump in, and they, they talk for another two minutes, and they stop, and you're going, okay, I'm trying to piece together. <laughs> I sort of have what they're talking about, but I really don't know because I missed the first big part of it, obviously, and they didn't come back and get me caught up. In the Bible, you can't just grab passages and read them and feel like you understand what you have to read the whole thing. So here's how Luke 11 begins. 
One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When Jesus finished praying, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Ah, so who's this parable for? It's for the disciples. Because he spoke, that's the context. Why did Jesus give this teaching? Because they said, teach us to pray. Jesus is answering that request of his disciples. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are his disciple, you're his follower. If you said to Jesus, teach me to pray, this is the kind of thing he wants you to understand. So, so this is to his disciples, if you're a Christian, it's to you, and it's Jesus explaining when they said, teach us to pray, so this is what Jesus says. So we're, we're gonna pick this up in verse five. So Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and you say, friend, let, uh, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Now, in the ancient world, when someone came to your home, you let them in, and you fed them. So this is like a critical moment. They, don't, they, they can't give what custom would say, what a good host would give. So he goes to a neighbor and says, you know, hey, can you get me, I got these friends, I need three loaves of bread, right? He's coming, I have no food to offer. Verse 7. And suppose the one inside, so, G, so Jesus is telling the story, suppose now this man comes and says, I've had some guests come, I wasn't expecting them. Can I have three loaves of bread? The one inside says, don't bother me. The door's already locked. And my children and I are in bed. Everyone's asleep. We're all in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, Jesus kind of, as he, within the story, he says to them, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, midnight, can I have some bread? Three loaves, please. I've got some guests. I need, he said, Friendship might not get that person out of the bed, but the boldness of this asker, the shameless audacity, it's midnight. Do you think that this guest coming knows they're asleep? There is no TV. There's no late night activities. In the ancient world, when it got dark, it was dark, and everyone went to sleep. In the story, this person knew that everyone was asleep. He knew he was invading their space and their sleep, and yet he comes and he knocks. Yet I tell you, Jesus says, even though he will not get up and give the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, your just crazy boldness, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Okay? Now it shifts. Now Jesus is teaching. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Oh, that's where that passage shows up in the Bible. Right after this parable about this rude neighbor coming at midnight and asking for bread. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, verse 11, this is where things shift. This is where Jesus says, so you might read this and you go, okay, so here's the point of the parable. God doesn't really care about our needs. But if we bug him and if we're really bold and shamelessly audacious, then he'll give us what we want. Is that the point? No. The point is if we as human beings will respond, how much more will a God who loves us? So he goes on in verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, daddy, can I have some fish to eat? We'll give him a snake instead. Hey, here's a rattlesnake. Which, which father would do that? What's the answer? What father, what caring father would do that? None, Right? Or if the son asks for an egg, the father would give him a scorpion. He wouldn't do that. And then Jesus says this in verse 13. If you then, though you are evil, it doesn't mean you're purely and ultimately evil, but it means if you then, you're broken, you're sinful, you're not perfect, you have evil in your heart. If you then, with, with your brokenness, your sin, even you who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, here's the key. How much more? Say that with me. How much more, one more time, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Lord, this is our prayer. As we take some moments and think about the message of this parable, and Jesus, what you taught so clearly, will you help us understand that we can picture another human being being gracious and generous, even in our brokenness? But how much more, oh God, are you waiting to hear us and to answer our prayers? That's the prayer in the middle of my sermon. 
I'm going to be praying at the end of my sermon, too. Okay, so, so Dennis knew the time. I'm sorry, Dennis. Dennis knew his time to come up was when I prayed. But I got, look back there. Everybody look back there. How much time do I have to preach? Look back there. The, 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 <laughs> ten minutes and two seconds. But we're doing, we're doing communion together. And, and Dennis knew, come up when Kevin prays. The problem with Kevin is he just prays all the time. And so I pray right in the middle of stuff. And so th- I'm in the middle of my sermon still. I'm going to go like this. When I go like this, let's pray. Boom. Then you <laughs> All right. So let's dig into the scriptures, all right? Here's some reflections, and we're going to kind of walk through this passage, all right? That was 100%, I take 100% ownership. That was my fault, because I said, Dennis, come up when I pray. I didn't know I I was going to pray right there. I just felt like we needed to pray. If I pray again and don't do this, don't come up, all right? I'll let you know. All right, we're going to have fun with this, D. All right. So reflection number, as we look at this passage, just some insights for us to take into our hearts and reflect on as we want to grow in prayer and learn from the parable of Jesus. Reflection number one. We all have experience of being turned down, even by friends. As the passage begins, he tells a story. Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey, he's come to me, I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bug me, don't bother me. The door is already locked, my children and I are in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. We've all had moments in life where we went to a teacher and said, can I have a couple more days on that, on that project? I had this and that, happened. nope. You get the grade you get. We've all had parents at times where they'll say, nope, that's it, no more. We've all had bosses who say, nope. We've all experienced that. So we start to think that God's gonna be like all the other people in our life. We've all been turned down and told no. So, so I think there's times where we might come to God and think, and think oh, do I wanna, do I dare ask? Do I dare seek? Do I dare knock? Do I, if I knock, am I gonna bug him? Do I dare come to the God of the universe and bring my my silly little thing about my, my, my knee and the problem there, the, this person. Do, do I do, when God's, I mean, God's taking care of nations and, and, and do I dare come? We've all been turned down and had the door, had somebody say, nope, not gonna help you. And what can happen is we can start to imagine that God's gonna be like that too. And so because of our life experiences, there's times where, where we simply resist coming and asking of God because we think we already know the answer. Here's a question. When you come to God and ask for what you need, what do you expect? Do you expect God to answer as a loving father? Now, let me be really clear, theologically and biblically. When you read all of scripture, no matter what you may have heard from other preachers or or, or TV preachers, the Bible does not teach that every time you pray to God, if you pray with enough faith in the right words and the right way, you'll always get what you want. The Bible does not teach that. Some of you have heard, the Bible says, if you, pre, if you pray with enough faith, you'll always get what you ask for. The problem is the Bible doesn't teach that and the Bible doesn't reflect that. We come and ask of God for anything, anytime. And God in his wisdom will often say, yes. Sometimes he'll say, let's wait on that one. And sometimes God says no. Because he's wiser than you and wiser than me. God doesn't always say yes to everything I ever pray. And and, and here's the problem. And as a pastor, I've had enough years under my belt of being a pastor. If I tell you, listen, if you pray with enough faith, you'll always have your prayer answered in the affirmative. You'll always get God's yes every time. And then you pray in faith and it doesn't happen. What does that tell you? You lack faith. Early on in our ministry at the first church I pastored, this family, the Lackey family, had a little boy, Stephen. When we came to the church, Stephen was dying of leukemia. The elders of the church had come and anointed him and prayed over him for healing. The family, this is a family of deep faith in Jesus. And they had prayed and prayed and prayed. When I came, they said, will you come and anoint him with oil and pray for healing? And I said, yes, I will. And I prayed and we prayed in faith, knowing that God has the power to heal. And there's times where God says, yes, I'm healing. But if you tell that family, if you pray with the right way, with the right words, with the right faith, it is guaranteed your son Stephen will be healed. And if he doesn't end up being healed, who bears the weight and the responsibility for a lack of faith for the death of that child? His parents. That is not what the scriptures teach. We always ask. We ask in faith because God can do all things. And when God answers yes, we give him glory. Amen? Amen. And when God says, you know what, wait a while, we keep walking with him. Amen? Amen? And when God says no, even if we don't understand why, we say, Lord, you are still Lord. 
I've had plenty of prayers where God has, I thought it was the right thing and God answered no. Some of those prayers, years later, I looked back and I said, thank you, God, for saying no. I didn't know what I was praying. I didn't know, I didn't understand. Some of those prayers, I still don't understand why God said no. And I'll probably carry that to my grave and the grave is one moment and then I'm with Jesus and I'll say, Jesus, help me understand. And I think all things will become clear then. And I think when Jesus explains to me why he said no, I'll go, I didn't understand. I didn't get it. But, but, but we should always come and expect and ask in faith and ask with boldness and let God take it from there. Reflection number two. When something really matters, we should ask with bold and audacious faith. Verse 18. I tell you, Jesus says, even though he will not, this person in the house will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, because of your bold faith, your confidence, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Here's my question for you. Do you believe that God hears, cares, and will actually act in response to your prayers? Do you believe that God hears your prayers? Do you believe that God cares about your prayers? He does hear, he does care, and he does answer. The problem is the answer is not always what we want, and so if God doesn't answer the way we want to, we start saying, well, then maybe God doesn't answer prayer. No, God answers prayer, he just doesn't always answer it the way I want him to. Bold faith is saying, God, I believe you can answer this prayer. God, I ask in confidence, knowing that you have all the power to do it with absolute faith, and I entrust in you, but Jesus, I will worship you no matter what comes. Because if you say you're gonna stop worshiping him in Jesus when things don't work out exactly how you want, want them to, there will come a point where you will stop worshiping Jesus. You will not have everything go in your life the way you wish it should. I wish I could say you do, but you, you cannot read the, the histories of the saints and the people who lived through times of scripture and all through history that walked with Jesus and say, oh, look at every person who walked in faith, things went their way. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, who was killed by the Nazis literally days before the concentration camp he was in. He was a Christian pastor and he resisted the Nazi regime thrown into a concentration camp and killed just days before that camp was released. Do you think he was praying, Lord, if you could let me get out of here and do, he was a young man and do ministry and serve you, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Do I understand why Dietrich Bonhoeffer died in that camp? No, I don't. But I know his testimony as a witness has touched lives, on hundreds of thousands, millions of lives since then. One day, there's things I want to say, Lord, help me understand. I think God will make all things clear. Right now, I don't fully understand. But we, we pray with boldness and confidence. Reflection number three. God is inviting and waiting for you to ask, seek, and knock. And a little bit later in the service, after we have communion and sing a song, we're going to actually take some time in prayer to ask and seek and knock, to cry out to God. And we're going to create some quiet space just for you to bring some things before the Lord. And, and say, I want to, God, I want to ask of you. I want to seek you for, for your wisdom. I want to knock and cry out to you for this. And do it with faith. And say, God, you can do all things. And I pray in the powerful name of Jesus. And I will worship you and follow you and honor you however you answer. But God, I'm asking. This is how I'm asking. I'm asking that you heal. I'm asking that you change. I'm asking that you restore. I'm asking that you provide. Pray with boldness. Verses 9 and 10. So I say to you, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Just in case you didn't get the point, verse 10, for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Again, this is not saying you always get your way, but it's saying there's, you will see God work in this way, keep asking, keep praying. So can you hear and receive the heartbeat of Jesus' invitation? He wants you to ask. He wants you to seek. He wants you to knock. God isn't looking for vague, kind of fuzzy prayers. God, God, I guess you kind of would help in this situation. Say, God, I pray for healing for this person. I pray for restoration. This is a broken relationship. God, will you restore this relationship? Will you bring these people back together? I can't predict what's going to happen. I can't make them come back together. And, and th th but I'm going to pray in the power of Jesus' name for healing and restoration with boldness. So when we go to prayer later, you're going to have time of kind of silent prayer in your heart. But man, in your heart, pray and cry out with boldness. And then reflection number four. God is bigger and better than you dream. And this is how, the, this, is how the, this, this section of scripture ends. Now, now the parable is done, but now Jesus is explaining to us that, that the guy in the parable who helped out because of the shameless audacity of his neighbor, God's not like that. That's just a person. God's way better, okay? So he finishes by saying, <clears throat> which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake, snake instead? He goes, no, nobody would. Or if he asked for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Nobody would. 
If you then, though you have evil in your hearts, though you're broken, though you're sinful, if you though are who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, if you can do that, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There's some prayers that God may say yes, wait, or no. There's other prayers that he'll always answer yes. God, will you fill me more with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit so I can live for you? Yes. Every, there's certain prayers. God, will you show me how I need to grow in holiness to be more like Jesus? Yes. There's certain prayers that, that are always answered in the amen. The ones about the needs in our lives are sometimes answered differently, but God still hears and we still pray with boldness. So here's the last question. Will you ask of God with deep belief that he is good, that he loves you, and he wants to answer your prayers? Will you pray with confidence? Will you pray with boldness? Now, right now, I'm going to close my sermon in prayer, <laughs> and, and we're going to go to worship. The worship team is coming. So, so Jesus, we pray together. Uh, we pray thanking you. For, your, for the stories you told, Jesus, these simple, beautiful, profound stories that awaken our hearts, that move our souls, uh, that, that teach us what it looks like to, to live for you and to follow you. And so we pray right now, as we come to communion, as we think together about what it means mm. to come into your presence, that in this time we're really fulfilling what you called us to do, to do this, and every time you do, in remembrance of me. So Jesus, in the quietness of this moment, prepare our hearts to partake of the bread and remember your body broken, to partake of the cup and remember your blood shed. With hearts quieted before the Lord, I want to ask you, if you're at home online, I know we have a lot of people online at home. Um, if you haven't yet, would you just get some crackers and juice or get some bread and wine, whatever you want to use for communion, would you just take a moment and get those elements and keep listening as we read the scriptures and prepare our hearts. If you're here in the worship center, uh, you should have those little communion uh, kits with the, with the elements. If you don't, our team members are already in the aisles. They're gonna walk up. Just kind of raise your hand as someone comes up and just, they'll make sure you have one. And just peel off the side first with the bread and just take that wafer and hold that in one hand. And then peel off the other side with the juice and just kind of hold that. So you, so you have the bread in one hand. So remember the body of Christ, you have the cup in the other hand. And just quiet your heart as you listen to the scriptures. In Isaiah 53, the prophet, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words pointing to our Savior. Centuries later, he wrote these words, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Listen to God's word in the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As we come to the table to share communion, if you are a follower of Jesus, even if you're visiting from another congregation, if you're online or on our campus, you say, well, I come from a different church, am I welcome to partake? If you are a follower of Jesus, you've come to the cross and received him as your savior, and you follow him as the leader of your life, this is his table, not our church's table. Jesus set this table with his own body and blood. So please partake with us as one church family, as the family of God. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and our, our midweek service once a month is really focused on those that are believers, but if you come here and you haven't yet received Jesus, we're so glad you're here. We believe that God's brought you here. Your way to partake isn't so much using the elements because you're not quite sure what this means, but your way to partake is just to listen and to watch and to see what this means to the people who are partaking because this is deep in our souls. This reminds us of the work of Jesus. When we come to communion, 
we celebrate the presence of Jesus among us. And Jesus asks us to remember him. So just quiet your heart right now as you hold in one hand the bread, as you hold in the other hand the cup, as you remember his body and his blood. Remember Jesus. Remember that he left the glory of heaven just to come and give his life for you. Remember the life he lived, how he loved the children and cared for them, how he went to the broken and the forgotten and healed them and restored them and gave them dignity, how he called common fishermen and high-level business people to be his disciples, his followers, how he reached out to men and women and showed his grace. Remember the life of Jesus and remember his sacrifice, that he took the cross and took our sin and took our shame to set us free. Use this time to remember Jesus. When we come to the table also, we come as a family. And I want to say, those of you that are online, if you're, if you're somewhere, if you're, if you're we're traveling and you've just pulled off the side of the road and you're watching on your phone and you're just taking time to be part of this time, if you're in a hotel somewhere in business, if you're with the military around the world, wherever you are, I want you to know, even if you're in a room or a car or an apartment alone, you're not alone. The Spirit of God is with you and the family of God. We're part of the same family. Our hearts are bound together. If you're in the courtyard or here in the worship center, um, you're surrounded by people who love Jesus. We're part of his family. Communion isn't about just me and Jesus. It's about us and Jesus. Let's enjoy the community we have as communion takers together. And we celebrate communion because of his amazing grace. We need reminders. As people who forget all the time, Jesus knew that. He knew it about his disciples. And he said, I'm going to give you this so that you will never forget. You can always do this and remember me. And grace is unearned favor. It's not how life works for us usually. We have to earn everything. But the most powerful thing of all, he gave to us and we can't earn it. We just soften our hearts and receive it. So this bread here reminds us of his body. Why bread? Why did he pick bread? Because in the ancient world, bread was everything. It was, it was full of vitamins and deeply nutritious. And the harvest was a big deal. And, and if you had bread, you were going to be okay in that world in those times. And he picked this bread. And it reminds, he, he said, do this to remind you of my body broken for you. And it helps us remember his love and his sacrifice. So let's break the bread and invite you to partake of the bread with me now. And at that table, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the covenant, this new reminder, signed and sealed by his blood. She said, every time you partake of this, he said, remember me. In the book of Hebrews, there's these sobering words, these sobering words, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. In our modern dignified world, that seems brutal. But the point is this. The price is going to be paid for our sins. And Jesus shed his blood to pay the price. And if you're gathered with us online or on campus and you've received his grace, his blood, just like the sacrificial blood of the Passover lamb that was placed in the door and the angel of death passed over, the blood of Christ placed on our hearts cleanses us. As we partake of this cup, let's remember the price that Jesus paid, the salvation he offered, and the freedom we receive through his shed blood. Let's partake together. we offer our deepest thanks and gratitude for your sacrifice on our behalf and because of this grace we are reconciled with our Heavenly Father we humbly come before you tonight to seek you more and more for who you are and not just for what you provide us or do for us 
Help us to spend time in your presence, Jesus. Not for what we can get from you, but for what we can give you. Jesus, fill us with your love so that our love may flow back to you and out to others. We pray that our lives would glorify you in thought, word, and actions. And that with each passing day, we would draw ever closer into close communion with you. And it's in your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.